Well, when we sit down, it's time for the conversation. And today, we just want to talk to two guests and find out how they're adapting to the new normal. What does the new normal look to them? How have they been disrupted and how are they innovating to be able to stay afloat during this uncertain times? Our first guest is Joy Doreen Bira. She is a journalist. She is the creative director, Africa Speaks. She's a correspondent, Business Africa at DW, previously strategic uh, uh, communication advisor at extractive strategic advisory facility and also she previously worked as a business news reporter and anchor at the standard media group joy thank you for making time let us begin by just putting some things into context just recently kenya marked 100 days of covid 19 in kenya and i want to find out so far how has covid maybe disrupted your life and your work thanks indiro for having me um COVID-19 has or happened at a time where I guess we were getting into the most active part of the year uh, for those of us who are into uh, strategic communication and consultancy. So I would say that by the time these directives came into effect, um, there was a lot that was disrupted. A lot had to change. Um, if there were travels that had to be made, all of those had to be cancelled. Uh, because of the directives that had been put in place, um, you know, countries that had also put on hold international travel and, uh, you know, blocked for um, quite a while up until today international travel. So all the events that I had that were outside of Kenya had to all be cancelled and postponed uh, to further notice um, just because travel was, was, was impossible. So that aside, of course, it had to affect the fi financial aspect of things. Um, but then again, it did also come with other opportunities. So it is a crisis. Of course, it breaks you down in the beginning, but then you have to repackage, reinvent, and stay afloat. Literally what I had to do, I had to repackage, reinvent, to make sure that things uh, that had been canceled before uh, could now be moved into a virtual world. And that virtual world is what actually brought everything back into place. And we'll get to that in a minute, but the disruption of everything brought a new normal and it meant working from home. How has that experience been like for you? Ah, working from home has been an interesting scenario. Uh, but I must say that even before COVID-19, I was working from home at least two days in a week and then going out the rest of, of the days of the week. But now it's the other way around. I am only going out maybe once or twice a week. And then the rest of the time I'm working from home. And then of course, in addition to that, there is homeschooling of the kids uh, because they have to do Zoom classes. And then in the middle of that, you also have probably a work video conferencing call um, that you have to attend to, and sometimes they will fall around the same time. So you have to literally compartmentalize yourself uh, within this home space to see how many hours you're going to dedicate to homeschooling and how many hours you're going to dedicate to uh, work. And sometimes because of the difference in time zones uh, with the people that you're working with, that can be quite tricky. But um, every once in a while, you know, if, if a child has to miss a class for 30 minutes just because your work is urgent, you have to make those decisions as well. Yeah, so it's, it's been interesting, but at the same time, it's also opened our eyes to how else, you know, work can be done. Working from home is not really such a bad thing. Now that we've spent a lot of time at home, it's not really a bad idea. And work as we know it has changed or is changing. It will never be the same again. For example, if it was before Corona last year, you'd be seated next to me here in studio. Now we are having a virtual conversation. From your end, how has work changed? Right. Um, so now more than ever, I guess people are starting to understand, even some of the uh, people that I work with, some of the companies that I work with are starting to understand that uh, physical offices are not really as as important as we had thought them to be. Um, what we are now starting to understand is that many companies are becoming more lenient to work from home uh, strategies. And these work from home strategies are now 
uh, helping people as well to think about implementing the infrastructure needed to rework to work remotely. And by working remotely, it means that I do not really have to be in a setting of home, but I just have to have the devices that I need or the infrastructure that I need uh, to make this happen. So it, it might be maybe that on the way to uh, the central business district, and then I have to quickly check my email and respond to uh, a certain request. And I have to make sure that I have the necessary requirements a good internet connection, or maybe a mobile printer, a mobile scanner, to make sure I'm able to freely and quickly um, attend to certain needs that have to do with work. So a lot is changing. The infrastructure is moving from both, uh, and it's now coming down into one device. And that is something that I think employment Now, moving on, the media industry, which is a space that you also operate in, has been greatly disrupted by coronavirus. What are some of the disruptions that you've seen from your end? And moving forward, how can we remodel to fit into the new normal? Um, well, to respond to that question, I'd have to possibly be a media owner, but let me try. Uh, what I've observed with the media industry today is that, um, unlike before, Advertisers have scaled down on advertising because uh, I guess now more than ever, people are not really uh, digging into their pockets to spend as much as they were spending before. Um, from the banking sector to, I guess, um, eateries, all of them have scaled down on advertising. But while they've scaled down on advertising, they've really gone big on online advertising, which happens to be more affordable and uh, easy on the eye because we're holding smartphones or smart devices um, compared to maybe five years ago. So advertising is now going more online and because it's affordable on those platforms, I think media houses are going to have to re-strategize and into uh, the online world because that is where most of the advertising um, financing is going. And also another thing I think that media houses right now need to also rethink about uh, putting up structures or infrastructure and think about how best they can outsource certain services instead of having to do them by themselves. That way they're able to save up on uh, finances or funds needed to invest in certain projects. Now they can just outsource them and get exactly the same product that they would have done if they were investing in it themselves. Because what we're seeing now is that we have more content generators out there uh, who are putting their content on platforms like YouTube, like Instagram and Facebook, and they're attracting advertisers on those same platforms. And that means they're eating into the revenue of media houses. So media houses can also take advantage of the fact that some of the personalities they work with are brand enough to carry some of their advertising. So maybe they now need to look that they work with and also look into how best they can uh, deliver online as much as they are delivering on mainstream media. And um, was that one of the reasons that informed your decision to take your journalism online? And also most recently, you've been very active on Instagram doing these Instagram lives with a variety of people from world over. Right. Um, so the conversations online, if, if I'll just uh, drift into that a bit, it really is, is more, it started as a pastime, but with the kind of feedback that I'm getting, um, maybe I should now start how else I can monetize it. But again, it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, people are consuming content more on uh, unconventional platforms uh, like Instagram because that's where they think maybe uh, the content of what they're interested in is found. So these are some of the um, issues that the mainstream media houses need to look into and see how they can tap into that talent that's online because content generation has now moved away from uh, being so particular about whether or not something was properly uh, produced, if it followed the right production guidelines. 
It's now moving into the raw content and people are still consuming content in its raw form and going ahead to uh, attract revenue. So that is an avenue that needs to be explored going forward because um, the advantage that mainstream media houses have is that they have the numbers, the followers, they have the viewership. So it's only a matter of tapping into uh, that online world and see how they can strike a balance. It requires a lot of agility, but done and it can succeed. And speaking of content, there is kind of a content renaissance happening currently online. The kind of conversations that we've had just by the mere fact of looking at the first half of 2020, we've had conversations with regards to Black Lives Matter. There have been conversations on sexual abuse, gender-based abuse, and now coronavirus. Even whatever we are churning out on coronavirus, people are very particular with what they want. And sometimes it's the difficult conversation that cannot be had on traditional media, but but those of you in digital media have the leeway to have these conversations. Yeah, we do have the leeway to have these conversations because one, it, it's so easy to access uh, news sources online because you know they do not have to move from one physical location to the other. If you actually can interest them in conversations to do with topical matters like Black Lives Matter, police brutality, or the effects of COVID-19 on people's uh, businesses and income, it's easy to get people in the comforts of their home and just tell them, you know what, can we have a conversation on Facebook Live? Or can we talk about this on Instagram Live? Uh, because I think that there's a lot of people, including your followers, who would be interested in conversations like this. And people are actually open to the idea of voicing their opinion on these platforms uh, because they do not have to go through, um, you know, the hassle of, of saying, so what am I going to put on or um, what is my outfit going to be? Is it going to be studio ready or is the kind of content that I'm putting out going to be the kind that um, loud on mainstream media? Because mainstream media has uh, the electronic law where you cannot say certain words because they would be deemed uh, inappropriate, but when they are on these other platforms, you know, they are open to saying their or giving their opinions without really being concerned about who exactly they're hurting or if what they say is going to affect the advertisers of the channel on which they're being interviewed. So there are all of those complexities that I think are really interesting in these times where um, mainstream media on one hand is a profit-making business, but at the same time, it also needs the kind of content uh, that people are interested in above and beyond the politics that we do see on many mainstream media houses. Enjoy this hippo that you're interacting with online is some of the people whose businesses have been affected by coronavirus and some severely disrupted. Some have taken pay cuts, some have completely lost their jobs. You've worked previously as a business journalist. From that experience and what we are seeing now, how can they begin rethinking and remodeling their businesses, bearing in mind that from the look of things, coronavirus is not going anywhere anytime soon? Right. Um, so I think that while coronavirus, you know, caught everyone off guard, um, the advantage is that it has allowed for the people in charge of these businesses to also rethink um, how else, you know, they can they can do their businesses. Um, I spoke to people who said they've had to literally spend all of their savings that are left and then start from scratch. But the advantage is that now it has given them the opportunity during this time to understand what market changes are taking place, um, where people's interests are, and uh, what exactly they like and what they do not like, um, what they consume, what they wouldn't consume, or what, what periods they would consume more, what hours of the day they would consume more. So um, this period or this quarantine period has allowed for all of these uh, things to happen. So now businesses are going to get out of this much smarter more agile and also more precise about the direction that they want their consumers uh, to tap into the content that they're giving them or into uh, the businesses uh, models that they're putting out there. Finally, Joy, where do we go from here or where do you plan to go from here? Um, uh, honestly, for me, the bottom line is when, when you are in a crisis, and, and this is how I'm dealing with it, 
is that yes, it's, it's going to affect you, but you know, you're not going to live your life saying I've been affected by uh, COVID-19 pandemic, my business is down and all that. You just have to pick up the pieces, reinvent, repackage, and uh, still get afloat. Because if you do not do that really, I think that is also one way of showing that um, you did not have a plan B if you didn't have a plan B, what does that say about uh, what you're trying to do? So go back to the drawing board, look at the opportunities. There are always opportunities, even in crisis. Um, some of the um, financial aspects of things where I felt like, you know, I had lost it all. Now I'm finding it all virtually and I'm getting all of these uh, opportunities online that I possibly hadn't thought about even pre-COVID-19. So it's really a matter of repackaging and reinventing and making sure that the kind of uh, business models and business plans you're having have room for change um, to move virtually as and when need be. Thank you so much for making time. I think our takeaway is there's always an opportunity in every crisis. You just have to find it. Absolutely. Thanks Thank you, Joy. Me. Now, we are joined by Zakaria Gashir. He is our second guest, and he will be telling us how the new normal looks like in the health sector for him. He is a Kenyan registered community health nurse. He's currently working at Kenyatta National Hospital in the theater department. He's also worked at Nakuru Nursing Home War Memorial Hospital in Nakuru, and he's also been doing free surgical camps for two consecutive years now. The first one was in Kisumu Urology Camp, second and third in Meru County. Thank you so much for making time, Zakaria. I want to find out from you, how does the new normal look like from the 13th of March when Mutahi Kagwe announced that the first coronavirus case has been confirmed in Kenya? How did things change in the hospital? Uh, the new normal in the hospital sector, uh, we are having so much uh, changes. Uh, I even say so. Uh, we have been doing uh, more few coming in for, uh, for DJ Cup, the normal routine, uh, different things have always uh, happening. We have been, uh, in most cases, uh, we have had uh, being sent back. Then we are told, uh, we, we call you more for the relatives of the patient. When we call you, that's when we are going to come. So it's that you bring a uh, lot of discomfort for the pain and also for us. And uh, what kind of changes have you been seeing being implemented in the health sector and even in hospitals since the confirmation of the first COVID-19 case? Okay, uh, some of the decisions that have been made, uh, we are having PPAs which are which has not been uh, most of the things. But uh, right now we're seeing all everyone is Social distancing, 1.72 meters for most of the cases. We have, been, have had uh, such being put the leave, having uh, less, less pull, and the way of standing also. Uh, different people coming, have uh, fewer people in the hospital. A lot and a lot of people in the hospital. Having like uh, different people, uh, the hospital uh, minimizing the number of people in the hospital so that uh, we can still have a fresh end of a bit of social distancing in the hospital. Speaking of seeing fewer and fewer people in the hospital, there was a time I was listening to British doctors and they were saying the pandemic after coronavirus pandemic will be that there will be an influx of very many sick people who shied away to go to the hospitals when they needed these services because they were afraid of coronavirus or because uh, the hospitals were overwhelmed and couldn't render these services. For example, dialysis and cancer patients. Are we seeing that in the country? So I've just had a bit of uh, dialysis and patients in the uh, in the country. The virus kind of disrupting that normal health, particularly for long-term illnesses or chronic illnesses. Ah, okay, okay. We are having a lot of difficulty for these patients because, for one, patients need continuous follow-up. 
and by continuous when these patients come on let's say a weekly or for some of these genes because dialysis is very very crucial that is for the dialysis to have the diabetes patient have the hypertensive patient have the with the or hiv who need continuous follow up for these patients so now when you have the uh, cases of covid-19 when you have seen like this patient will uh, lead to uh, cases which are like increased cases of this uh, nene so the uh, like the the uh, the patients who are uh, uh, diabetic you may find that the patient has maybe let's say a uh, wound in shown something like that the hypertension the uh, pressures have gone high but because to come to the hospital we find these patients are having more complications because of staying at home which is very very sad thing and also we are talking about the, the some of patients the thing we are having is a normal uh, patients not the we I like calling them class uh, pregnant that's uh, they're very very vulnerable they it's not an illness for me it's like something uh so we are saying that uh, the pregnant it's very hard for them they miss antenatal clinics mostly and these antenatal clinics are the ones which are very vital for them it helps them in the growth of the baby strength and also very uh, nutritious they have a lot in this this uh, forums so if you they are disrupted you may find a lot of cases that uh, the child are being born malnourished they have have the things they like threaten us and so forth. yeah and you're speaking of some of the gaps but what are some of the lessons that you think from a medical practitioner's point of view coronavirus is trying to teach us what are some of the areas that we can improve that the virus has exposed as points of weaknesses uh, some of the lessons we are having is a lot a lot less but uh, if I can mention a few, uh, to strengthen our health sector. Because like right now, you can't say, even if I have half the millions of money and I have corona, I can be treated outside of India or uh, America, I will be treated this country. So if I, most of the, the politicians or members of parliament don't strengthen the health sector in this country we are the ones to suffer all of us including them so if we don't have the health sector this is what will will happen to us so we have to strengthen the health sector uh, and also see how how we can uh, be able to uh, to get to get our health sector in this country to a higher level there also these there's about uh, the health coverage universal health coverage it was one of the uh, four pillars of the uh, the national government so this you you uh, uhc we have not had any progress about it and it was one it was meant to uh, the common monaichi even every across the whole uh, country across the east whether you are middle class you are high class you will get comprehensive health care so not, by now not given any progress but if uh, implementation of this is done we'll have a strong health care system in our country finally zachary and moving forward what will the new normal in health care both at the hospital and public health look like due to coronavirus Uh, the new normal. Hey, we are having a <laughs> very true, very true. I was saying we have uh, empty beds. Empty beds meaning patients are not coming to hostel. We're not having uh, the the country is not because they are not sick. That's one point that you need. It's not they are not sick. They are afraid of coming to this hospital thinking they will get this coronavirus in hospital. You see? 
come to think of it, very, coronavirus very is not going also, anywhere. So how can we adapt to the new normal in the health sector, both you health practitioners and public health? Uh, we are trying to, uh, one of the things that I as a practitioner, I'm also scared. I'm scared because I'm being uh, very transition to this, uh, this case. Yeah? I can't be the one who is transmitting this. I have a family at home. So if I go to, I, I, I come from uh, from the home, I have to go home. It's very, it's very, very uh, tiring. You see? As we are afraid, and uh, I'm afraid to help the person. Even if an emergency. Uh, during the past times, when somebody will come, not any about anything but saving life of this person. But right now, what is the new normal? This one has cost here. I don't know if he has. So I'll just stay away. Call the, the public, uh, the public health system. Tell them I want. I ha I have some we here who is uh, fallen. I don't know. What I don't know if he has corona or if it's an accident. The the new very very uh, challenging. You're coming to hospital. Me the person who doesn't have uh, PPE for helping patients. You see, it's very difficult for us. Yes. That's where we leave it and we hope that the government listens and we'll be able to create a safe working environment for people like you because without people like you, then we are unable to fight coronavirus at all and it will turn into a really bad pandemic in the country. Well, that's it for this segment. When we come back, Social Watch, my mic is off and your voice is on. <laughs>